Great Britain's R101 airship. After Britain's air minister died in the crash of the R101, the Baldwin government lost interest in airships as a means of international travel. It was happy, in fact, to sell the R100's £1 million sister ship for £450. Like the Titanic, the mighty airship R101 was considered practically indestructible. She was an enormous craft, her sheer bulk seeming to defy the elements even in their wildest moods. Majestically, she floated high above the awed British crowds who flocked into streets and fields to watch this monster, as long as two football fields, and almost 100 yards wide, sailed past. The passengers' lounge alone was 62 feet long and 33 feet wide. Fifty people could dine at a sitting, and those engines, great diesel power packs that could propel the five million cubic feet airship through the teeth of the most violent winds. But R101, for all her size and power, was not indestructible. For at 2am on October 5th, 1930, the pride of the British airship industry lay dead, blazing and mangled on a hillside in France. With her perished 47 of her complement, most of whom were government ministers, officials, and top lighter-than-air experts. It was the end of a dream, a dream to link the vast British Empire with a network of giant, dirigible services. The R101 catastrophe, which involved the deaths of men like Britain's Secretary of State for Air, Lord Thompson, and the Director of Civil Aviation, Sir Sefton Branker, determined the government to put her sister ship, the R100, up for sale. The R100 had cost the then huge sum of £1 million to build, but the government was happy to get rid of her for a mere £450. The story of the development of the ill-fated British airship industry really began during World War I, when German zeppelins floated over British cities bombing almost at will. Impressed by the success of these craft, the British waited until the war had ended and then embarked on a vast program of airship research and building. The wreck of the Zeppelin L-33, which had been brought down over England in good condition, served as the model for the first two British airships, the R-33 and the R-34. Both proved highly serviceable, and in 1919 the R-34 made the round trip from Britain to New York. Meanwhile, in August 1918, work had been started on the 2,700,000 cubic feet R-38, which was to be sold to the American government. But the transfer was never made, for on August 24, 1921, she broke in two during a test flight, killing 45 of her complement. It was this crash that caused the British government to lose interest in future airship building plans. In fact, the Secretary of Air, Sir Samuel Hoare, announced he was considering handing all the airship building material to the disposal board. This announcement caused consternation among the directors of the mighty Vickers Aircraft Company, which had sunk a vast amount of money into the airship project. The result was that after discussions with Vickers, Commander Burney, MP, put to the government a plan that provided for bigger and safer airships and their use to open up a network of Empire air routes. Burney suggested to the Air Ministry that a company should be formed to build and operate airships of 5 million cubic feet capacity, which meant they would be the biggest lighter-than-aircraft ever constructed. Private enterprise, Burney suggested, should contribute £500,000 to the company's capital, while the government would make a loan of £400,000 to be repaid out of profits. For a start, the ships would ply between London and Cairo, and when this route was established, a bi-weekly service to India would be introduced. As further airships were built, other routes would be open to Bombay, Singapore and Perth in Western Australia. It was expected these flights would take four, eight and ten days respectively. Bernie's plan was feasible, and because it was backed by the Vickers organisation, the Baldwin government fell into line. But even before official documents could be signed, Baldwin was out of office to be replaced by the Labor government led by Ramsay MacDonald. MacDonald was not impressed by airships in general, and the Burney plan in particular, and scrapped the whole idea. And there the matter might have rested had not Baldwin in 1924 regained office. One of his first acts after returning to Number 10 Downing Street was to resurrect Commander Burney's plan and agree to the formation of the Airship Guarantee Company, 
which almost at once signed contracts to construct the mighty R-100. At the same time, the Air Ministry was ordered to go ahead with the building of a sister ship, the R-101, which, with the R-100, would would pioneer the Empire's commercial air routes. After that, the R-33, one of the few earlier models that had managed to escape destruction, was taken out of storage and flown to the air station at Pullum, where the designers of the R-100 and R-101 could use it in tests. Then, on April 15, 1925, shortly after the R-33 had been moored to her mast at Pullum, hurricane force winds blew up and it seemed she would be torn free of her cables and hurled to destruction. At once a crew of 18, led by Flight Lieutenant H.C. Irwin, who was to captain the R-101 on her last tragic flight, went aboard intent on holding the bucking ship in position. But there was nothing they could do. A series of particularly violent blasts hit the airship and she broke away carrying part of the mooring arm with her. As the broken arm gyrated under the wind's force, the ship's outer skin was torn. Her forward gas bag ripped open and her nose smashed in, and she was heading straight for one of the air station's buildings. Desperately, Irwin ordered the discharge of two tons of ballast. This allowed the airship to ride over the building, but she was being blown backwards. At 2,000 feet, with her engines set at their maximum of 30 knots, she was still drifting at about 20 knots backwards. By late that night, the R-33 was well over Holland, but the wind had died dramatically, and Irwin was at last able to get her moving back towards England. It was not until the following afternoon, more than 24 hours after she had broken away, that she was tethered again at Pullum. Six months later, the R-33 was ready for the interrupted test flights. The most dramatic of these experiments consisted of slinging a small aeroplane under her at 10,000 feet. The plane was launched and later picked up again by means of a trapeze-like sling. Meanwhile, an enormous airship hangar was built at Karachi, and mooring masts were being erected in Egypt and Canada in preparation for round-the-empire services. At this point, the government refused more funds for design experiments, Thus it was that many revolutionary ideas were incorporated in the R-100 and the R-101 without tests of any kind. While the airships were structurally sound and were driven by powerful engines, later evidence indicated that the ships were too heavy and lacked a safe margin of lifting power over the scheduled load of 155 tonnes. In October 1929, work was finished on the R-101. She was the marvel of her age, with the most spacious passenger quarters ever provided on an airship. The lounge was 62 feet long, about half as broad, and had a raised promenade on either side fitted with observation windows. There were also sleeping quarters, a fireproof smoking room, and an electric kitchen that could provide the most exotic meals. But if her appointments delighted her builders, they were not so pleased with her performance when she was put through tests. When her lift and trim were tested, it was found her lifting power was 25 tonnes short of her useful load, meaning she probably would not be profitable. On October 14, 1929, and under the famed airship pioneer Major G. H. Scott, the R-101 prepared for her first real flight. Setting sail from her moorings at Cardington, she spent five hours in the air before completing what was regarded as a highly successful flight. Four days later, she drove into a 48-mile-per-hour gale and heavy rain, yet weathered the storm smoothly. On November 17th, the R-101 set out on an endurance flight of 30 hours and 35 minutes that took her over Scotland and Eastern Ireland. During the voyage, she crossed the Irish Sea four times. Although the press hailed the flight as the engineering epic of the century, experts in charge of testing were deeply worried. Her big diesel engines did not function smoothly, and during night flying she became heavy to handle. Corrections were made where possible, but at a Hendon air pageant she became heavy, and fuel had to be jettisoned before she could land. During a second flight she went into an alarming nosedive over Hendon because, as her crew said, she suddenly seemed to take on tons of extra weight. Actually, it was later discovered the trouble was caused when the airship's framework punctured a gas bag. After that, she was returned to her hangar, where extensive alterations were carried out. She sailed smoothly on her first test run after that, but the flight had little significance as the weather was dead calm. The R-101 was scheduled to set out on her first flight to Karachi on October 4, 1930. 
Experts suggested she should be subjected to further tests and adjustments before this historic flight was made, but they were frustrated by the political considerations. At the time, Empire Prime Ministers were attending the Imperial Conference, and British officialdom was anxious to impress them by getting the airship away. The result was that precisely at midnight on October 4th, the ill-fated R101 eased free of her moorings at Cardington, slid over London, and set a course across the Channel. Just two hours later, she lay a blackened skeleton on a Bouvet hillside in France. Minutes before the crash, the R101's radio operator had contacted Le Bourgeau to check his position. Told he was dead on course, he replied, Thank you, good night. Then the mighty craft ploughed on to her destruction. Thousands of Londoners accompanied by the Empire's Prime Minister stood to attention not long afterwards as the bodies of the dead passed through the streets. Most were buried in a common grave, for it was impossible to identify them. Their tombstones stand today as an enduring memorial to perhaps the most tragic era in aviation history.